Praise the Lord. All right, if you have your Bible with you this morning, I want you to open it up, if you would, to uh, praise the Lord. We'll, we'll just, I'm just going to go right into some things today, okay? We've been talking about the importance of watching our words, that if, uh, if we want to uh, really see transformation in our life, we're going to have to be careful about the things that we speak. We're going to have to put the right words in our mouth, and sometimes we have to begin by taking the wrong words out of our mouth. And often the reason that we don't have the fruit in our lives, we don't have the self-control we need, we don't have the victory we need, is because we have, as we would say, forked tongue. We have uh, two things that are coming out of our mouth. In one hand, as James said in James chapter 3, we're speaking blessing uh, to God, and with the other, we're speaking curses to ourselves and to others. And the Bible says these things ought not to be. Your words are powerful. And we have to get control of our mouth if we're going to move into the blessing that God has for us. And uh, in Psalm 34, which is the passage that God gave us for the year, in verse 11, it says, uh, verse 12, does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Uh, then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. You've got to keep, keep your tongue from evil or negative or wrong speech if you want to live the kind of life God wants you to live. And uh, so we've been looking at things that we need to get out of our mouth. And uh, we've talked about complaining. We've talked uh, also about lying and some other things. But today, I want to go a little deeper into this because uh, the Holy Spirit is just really speaking to me concerning this. Um, and there's a reason for it right now. Um, because we're as a congregation and as a people about to cross into a great promised land. And it's not that that happens once. We go into the promised lands of God in different seasons of life as we move forward. And then we get prepared through wilderness experiences to go into the next level. And just as God's people uh, wandered through the wilderness and then God uh, prepared them, they crossed over the Jordan and they were to take victory and to take ground, one of the first things the Lord said to them through their leader Joshua was that you have to be very careful that you put God's word in your mouth, that you are to think about it and to speak it day and night. Don't let God's word stop from coming out of your mouth because then you'll be able to do everything God is commanding you to do. So there's something about speaking the right words that impacts your ability to behave in the way that will be consistent with the blessing of God. And he said, don't let this, this word depart from your mouth, but meditate or speak it to yourself day and night. Then you will be able to see and to do everything I command you. And he said, then you will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. So there's something about getting the right words in your mouth. But after he gave them that command, they crossed over the Jordan, they went into the promised land, and the first city that they were to take was a city called Jericho. And uh, we're finalizing plans right now to take a tour of Israel and Egypt. And uh, we'll be announcing that shortly. But uh, when, we, when we go over, some of you, you'll see literally the places where these things occurred. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable because the geography backs up what Scripture says. And it tells us, the Bible tells us that when they crossed over, they went to Jericho. Now, Jericho is one of the oldest continuously, perpetually inhabited cities in the world. Some say the oldest, over well over 5,000 years. And they've actually found the ruins of the Jericho that would be consistent with the period of time mentioned in the Bible. And they found these massive walls all around this city of Jericho, and they found burned stones, and they saw that the walls had been destroyed and then later rebuilt. And it's just fascinating that it's right there in the ground. But the Bible says when they went to Jericho, it was a very fortified city. And they were told, Israel, that for seven days they were to march around the walls and listen, not say anything. Joshua chapter 6, don't say a word. Tell the people not to speak. And there's a reason for that because these people had gotten into trouble with their mouth before. God had brought them into the promised land and they decided to send spies in to check it out. They came back and they saw that they were over outnumbered and outgunned and they all began to whine and moan and complain and, and, and say 
say things, and, and, and basically God said, because of your words, I'm not going to let you go into the promised land. I'm going to have to let that, that flesh die off, and your children will go into the promised land. So 40 years later, now they're going into the promised land. They're about to take the first city, and the first thing God says to them is, shut up. Don't say anything. Every day I want you to march around the wall one time. So they get up. They all have to be quiet, and they march around the wall one time. They can't say a word. They go back to the camp. The next day they get up, they march around the wall a second time. Six days they march around the wall, go back to the camp, don't say a word. The seventh day, God tells them, get up and march around the wall seven times. And don't say anything. So on the seventh day, they march around the wall seven times, and the Lord said, when you've, after you've gone seven times around the wall on the seventh day, he said, then shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now, this is amazing. In other words, even before you have victory, shout, because in the mind of God, it's yours. Not he's going to give you the city, he's given you the city. But the first thing he had to, they had to do was shut up. And I believe it's because they were so used to, their mouths were so, got them into so much trouble. God said, now this time, don't ruin it with your words. Just be quiet and just march around. Yes, it's, every time you march around that wall, you're going to see how impossible it is. Every time you march around that wall, you're going to see how, how absolutely uh, you know, overwhelming it is. But there's something about marching around the walls of the impossible, marching around the dream, marching around the vision, and not saying anything not saying, oh my goodness, I don't know if I can do this. This is too much. Just be quiet. Don't say anything. You're going to have all those feelings, but just shut up. And then the last day, march around seven times. And then when you do open your mouth, all you can do is shout for victory. Shout as if it's yours because the Lord has given it to you and just give a shout. And, he did, and, and, and so they did. And on the seventh day, they shouted. And the Bible says that when they shouted, the Lord caused the walls to come tumbling down. I guess those angels must have gotten behind them and just shouted over them. But those walls came down and they went in and they took the city. Now there's something about that story that's powerful. Before you speak victory, you've got to audit and edit the negativity. You've got to take things away before you put the right things in. And this is something that's consistent throughout the word of God. So, so if, as we look at the word, we see that God wants us to speak the right things. And we've got to take the wrong things out of our mouth. And uh, I want you to look with me, if you would, um, to uh, the book of Colossians chapter 1. And we want to take a look at some speaking that we need to put away or get rid of. Colossians chapter 1. By the way, this last week, uh, we asked you to try something, to take a word fast, to take three hours in your day sometime, and to not say anything for three hours. How many did it? How did it work? Not many of you did it. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. The challenge is still there. There's something very powerful about not saying anything, about being quiet. Uh, because it makes when you do speak more powerful. Plus, when you shut up, you, you start listening better. You become aware of what's happening in your body, in your mind. And so uh, sometimes it's good to be quiet, and then when you do speak, let it be a shout. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, I, I, I just... This is so, oh God, help me to do this. In Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to believers. And he's going to talk to them about their behavior. He's going to correct them about the way that they're behaving. But what's so powerful about Colossians 3 is that it begins with an affirmative statement of who God's people are and what they have in Jesus Christ. It begins with an affirmation of their identity. And I'm, this is important because if you just hear me talk about things you shouldn't say and things you need to stop doing, but you don't understand that in the context of that, the reason God wants us to change what we're saying and doing is because it's not because we're trying to become something 
or earn something from God, it's because God has already done something for us and in us, and from that place of knowing who we are, then we begin to change what we say and do. Does that make sense? And this is a pattern throughout the epistles. Now, this is important. You won't find this pattern in the Gospels. That's because they weren't, nobody in the Gospels were born again. They were predominantly Jewish and some Gentile people that were living in a different time before Jesus went to the cross and was raised from the dead and the Holy Spirit had not been given to regenerate the human heart as we know happens today when a person believes in Christ. And so, uh, so when Paul writes, or the letters to the churches, he's writing to believers who, and who've already come to faith in Jesus, and they've experienced something through their faith, and so Paul begins by telling them who they are, and then he says, now because this is who you are, this is what you shouldn't be doing. That's not who you are anymore. And notice in Colossians, in verse 1, he starts with this statement, if you then were raised with Christ, everybody say, I'm raised with Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, in your spirit, you've been raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. In other words, where you put your mind makes a big difference in how you behave. You see, now get your mind on Jesus. Get your mind on Christ being raised from the dead and you being raised with him. Think like that. Look at the next verse. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Just say this. When I received Jesus, I died. And my life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's a reality. You were raised with Christ. You died your old life. Now your life is hidden with Christ in God. Look at the next verse. And then he said, and when Christ who is our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. I love that because it says if this is the case, if you're a believer, not only have you died to the old sinful nature, now your life is hidden with Christ in God. And in the future, when Christ returns, you will appear with him in glory. In other words, if you started the trip, you're going to finish the trip. It's a whole package. That's pretty exciting. He's telling them who they are. But notice he said, but you've got to think this way. You've got to put your mind in this direction. You've got to think about who you are in Christ, not just according to everything that is happening on the earth. Now he's going to revisit. Now he's going to talk about behaviors. Therefore, which means in light of the fact that you're risen with Christ, that your life is hidden with Christ and God, that Jesus is coming and you're going to be raised, that's who you really are. Therefore, put to death your members, Greek word melos, your body parts, which are on the earth. You see, the struggle that we have as believers is with our flesh. Our spirits are risen with Christ, but our flesh on the earth still hasn't been changed and it struggles with desires and temptations. And he's talking to believers. He tells them that they're risen with Christ, but he's also going to talk about how they're behaving. You see, you can be a born-again Christian and not be behaving like one. You say, really? Yes. In fact, that's what all the letters to the churches are about, telling them who they are and because this is who you are, now stop acting like this. So he said, now put to death your members or your body parts which are on the earth. Notice what he said. Um, and he's going to give us a list. Now notice, these are physical sins, things, behaviors. And he said fornication, which is uh, sex outside of the covenant of marriage. Uncleanness. Uh, passion. That, that passion would be in, in referring to uh, strong fleshy desires. Evil desires covetousness or greed, which is idolatry. Notice verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon, he didn't say you, the sons of disobedience. In other words, the world that doesn't come to Jesus and get redeemed is going to experience the wrath of God. That's not God's plan because Jesus came to redeem all of us from that. But if we don't receive Christ, you know, we're going to appear with him in glory, but those who are on the earth that reject Christ, they're going to experience the wrath of God. That's, he's not saying they will, because their life is hidden with Christ and God, but he's saying because of these behaviors, the Lord is coming to judge the world. Now notice this, 
in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. This is how you used to be when you lived in the world. But now, in other words, you're not that anymore. That's not who you are anymore. Put off, uh, but now yourselves are to put off all of these. The word put off means strip off, separate, take away. Now listen, you wouldn't tell believers to strip something off if they didn't have to strip something off. And this is what's so important. We have to realize that you can be born again, you can be saved, you can accept Jesus and love him and he can be in your heart, but you can still, and we all still struggle with our flesh. And because of God's love and grace and promise, we know God's gonna finish what he started in us, but that doesn't mean we just lay back and don't change. Because when you know who you are, you can change what you do. So Paul said, you're not like that anymore. That's not who you are. You're not part of the sons of disobedience. You're now in Christ. But listen, he wouldn't be telling them to put these things off if they weren't doing these things. So they were saved, but they weren't acting like it. And so Paul is going to identify, not to condemn them, but to help them to know these are the behaviors that really were part of your old life, and they're not supposed to be part of your new life, and you have to put them off. And then he says, notice this, Now he's going to give us another list. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Now, in the Greek, it's very interesting, but these lists of words, it's kind of, uh, just imagine he's saying this, put off of these all of these things, and then the last part out of your mouth, it's not just saying, you know, put off anger, put off uh, blasphemy, wrath, and also put off filthy language out of your mouth. It actually reads this way, put off all of these things out of your mouth. In other words, take away and put off anger out of your mouth. Put off wrath out of your mouth, put off malice out of your mouth, blasphemy out of your mouth, filthy language out of your mouth. In other words, he's talking about words. In the first list we read, he's talking about behaviors. Now he's talking about words. And he's saying not only do you need to put off or take away these behaviors, but you also need to watch your mouth. And you've gotta put these things out of your mouth. And he goes on to say this, And don't lie to each other. Lying is a verbal sin. Since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Mother, this isn't who you are anymore. You're now a new creature in Christ and you have, you have present tense, put on the new person. That's, in other words, the, the, the new spirit has been born again in you. Now, in your body parts, in your flesh, you need to put these things off because that's not who you are. So you need to stop this because, listen, because that's not your true identity. Does this make sense? And he gives a list of behaviors and he gives a list of things that we're to put out of our mouth. And in both cases, it's up to us to make these changes. Now notice, and then he's going to go on and again to give us another list in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, chosen of God, holy and beloved, notice what he's calling them, chosen, holy, and beloved. But wait a minute, I thought he was telling them to stop fornicating, stop uh, speaking angry words, stop speaking blasphemy, stop speaking filthy I mean, if they're acting this way, how can they be saved? Because they were born again by faith in the grace of God, and we all are born again by faith in the grace of God if we accept Christ, and our hearts are changed, but our flesh is still fleshy. And so we have to learn who we are in our spirits and then we can put off the behaviors and the words that we're supposed to put off. Are you listening to me? And just to affirm them again, he says, now listen, therefore you are the chosen of God, the elect of God, holy. You are holy and beloved. Now how could they be holy if they've got these things to put off? Because listen, in their spirits, they were new creations. When their spirits, they were believers, they were saved, their hearts, their hearts were filled with God, but in their bodies, your born-again spirits put in the same old body, and you've got to now learn to put on or behave like your new identity and not act according to the memory of your old identity. That's why you've got to set your mind on who you are in Christ and not on things of the earth. 
And so he said, and so he said, holy and elect, he said, put on these. So start acting like this. Tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Everybody say long suffering. Bearing with one another. Bearing with one. How many of you know sometimes you gotta bear with people? Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, and notice this, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. How did God forgive how did Jesus forgive you? He forgave you by faith in his blood and his love. Right? He forgave you and he forgives us because of his mercy. That's how we're supposed to be with each other. But above all these, put on love. These are, now he tells us to take things off and put things on, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Now, now he's going to talk, now he's going to give us a list of words again. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice these are all speaking commandments. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You can sing, you can speak psalms or, or, or proverbs or scriptures to each other. He said, put off filthy language, put off talk, angry talk to each other, put off all of these other things out of your mouth and put these in your mouth. He gives you a list of behaviors and words and he said, put these off. And then he gives you a list of behaviors and words and says, put these on. Praise God. Are you tracking with me? Now look in verse 17. This is powerful. 17 is going to summarize the lists. Remember he began by telling them in verse 1, this is who you are. Then he said, because of that, stop these actions and stop these words. You're holy and beloved. You're chosen. So now put on these actions and put on these words. Now, in verse 17, he's going to summarize the words and actions. Look what he says. And whatever you do in word and deed, words and actions, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So he's giving us a list of things to say and things not to say, a, th a list of things to do and a list of things not to do. And so I want to talk to you about one of the things in this list or a couple of things in this list. And I want you to notice that he makes this statement that we are to put away or put off in uh, verse 8, anger, wrath, malice out of your mouth. And so I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about angry words. Turn to somebody and say words of anger. I was doing some research this week and I found an interesting uh, research piece written by, um, by a Harvard professor about the, and it's uh, not spiritual at all, uh, it's just about the biological, psychological, and physical impact of, and also neurological impact of s spoken anger. And it's a dense piece. I, I will try to get a link for it. You could probably find it if you look it up. But it talks about the fact that observationally, when people speak out of anger, it does something in the brain that is instantly observable. The first thing that it does, it also happens, by the way, when you hear angry words. The frontal lobe of the brain that reasons and controls behavior begins to shut down. And the fight and flight mechanisms at the core of the brain are activated literally hundreds of chemical responses begin to happen and your brain becomes attenuated to action and negativity without reason or thought. And he talked about the fact, and he was really, uh, this professor was talking about how anger uh, makes it very difficult to perceive what's really happening. Because when you have strong anger, and especially if you're hearing anger or you're at speaking anger, it shuts down the reasoning part of the brain. 
And so he was talking about how, and really he was going into the detail, how do we then process anger and manage anger in a way that's helpful? And the thing that was very clear from the research is that anger that is fully expressed without any thought or reservation is unhealthy to the physical body, to the lifespan of a person, and also it, it literally shuts down the brains of others. Now, I don't have to go to research to tell you that some of you were raised in homes with a very angry person who was powerful. And uh, there is a healthy anger, there is a healthy fear of, of authority that's not bad, uh, that we need so that we can stay, especially as children, in safety. But overexpressed anger without any sense of compassion or without any sense of security shuts down the brains of children and actually hardwires them in a state of fight or flight or fear. And sometimes a child will grow up and just, be, just run away from anger all the time. Or a child will grow up and fight all the time. And this is the science. And I just want to challenge you because we're going to take a look in the balance of our time about what the Bible says about anger. And yes, God is, God, anger is, is an emotion that's in God. God has, we read it, wrath, he has anger. But God exercises it with perfect wisdom. And God balances that with his mercy and loving kindness. Amen? It's not that we can't have the feeling of anger. It's the way that we process it is very important. And we have to be very careful about what comes out of our mouth when we're angry, just from the science itself. But we don't need the science because the Bible says, put this out of your mouth. Stop speaking angry words. Stop speaking vengeful or wrathful words. And stop speaking in malice. So let's just for a minute go over to another passage. I just want you to see these. Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 are, in, in seminary, they're studied together because Paul uses the same approach to the Ephesian church, he did the, to the church at Coloss, and, he, and basically he uh, lays out the same argument, but he does it in a little different language. So in chapter 4 of Ephesians at verse 17, Paul speaking to believers said, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk, word walk means live, as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Now, this was a predominantly a Gentile church. Don't live like the rest of the world lives. In the futility of their mind. Notice again the mind. The problem is their thinking is not right. And so he goes on in verse 22. Just go to verse 22. He said, and he's telling them, that you put off, notice the language, strip away from your life concerning your former conduct. The old person which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. That old flesh nature is just corrupt if you give in to those flesh, those lusts. And he said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and how you think. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, if you're born again, you have a new spirit, and that spirit was created in God's image, and it's righteous and holy. But you're in a body that still is tempted to do things wrong. And he's saying, so you've got to learn to who you are and live out of your spiritual place and not out of the lust of your flesh. And the way that you do that is by changing how you think. You've got to stop thinking that I'm just like everyone else. You've got to start thinking, I'm born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. I've been recreated in Jesus. I have a new nature. You've got to think and speak that. And as you begin to know who you are, then you can begin to address what you're doing and saying. Just point to yourself and say, when I receive Jesus, I receive a new nature. I put off the old nature. And now I'm made in the image of God, in righteousness and holiness. That's who I truly am. So body, stop these things. That's what Paul's saying. You realize who you are and then stop these things. Now look, he's going to go through some lists, but it's important you see this. Verse 25, therefore, notice he's going to talk about behaviors of the mouth. Put away lying. 
Let each of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Speak truthfully. Notice this phrase, be angry and do not sin. Now, this is important. When he's saying be angry and do not sin, he's not telling you, you need to get angry. He's also not saying it's a sin to feel anger. What it's actually saying is, when you're angry, don't sin. In fact, most, most translations now re- render it this way. In your anger, don't sin. He's not saying you can't feel anger. We, need, we all get angry. We all have different kinds. He's saying, listen, when you're angry, don't sin. And he's going to tell us how we can sin in anger in a few verses. Just say this. When I'm angry, when I'm angry don't, sin. don't sin. Now, why? And he said, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. What does that mean? When you're angry, don't hang on to it. And stay in that angry place day after day after day after day. You need to get that. You need to get that out. And you don't, listen, it's important. You don't get that out by venting it on another person in its full majestic glory. (laughs) When you're angry, don't sin. And don't let the sun go down. Don't, Don't stay angry for days and days and days. Turn to something. Say, I'm not supposed to be mad for a long time. Now, the 27th verse brings it to a very spiritual level, and it's all connected. Nor give place to the devil. Now, this is what I'm going to say to you. When we allow anger to overwhelm us, not only does it shut down our brains, and it does all kinds of things to our bodies. There's an article in Psychology Today by Dr. Andrew Newberg, and he talks about, not from a Christian standpoint, he talks about how angry words spoken and heard not only make powerful changes in the brain, but it also encodes you in such a way that it limits your ability to think creatively. It actually impacts your health. It actually changes your neural circuitry. That's why living in an angry environment for a long period of time is not healthy. In fact, the proverb says this. It says, it's better to live on the corner of a rooftop than inside the house with an angry woman. The Bible says it. Now, it's not making fun of an angry woman. He's just saying, listen, it's, it, there's something about that environment when that slow burn is being felt everywhere, right? That is, it's like, I would just, I'd rather live on the rooftop than be in that house. Now, it's not condemning the woman. It's just making a statement about how unhealthy that is for someone. Same thing is true with a man that's raging all the time. And the wife and the kids are constantly on, on, on uh, pins and needles, And listen, I'm not trying to condemn people that are having strong anger, but we as believers have got to learn to put it off. We've got to learn to handle it in a biblical way because we'll give a place to the devil if we don't. And I'm going to tell you something. There isn't a divorce that's happened without words of anger, without words that were a part of it, words that were damaging, hurtful, and... and, uh, We have to be so careful. That's why the music we listen to. And and the research shows it's not just what you say, it's what you listen to. When you expose yourself to angry lyrics all the time, lyrics of rage, it literally is rewiring your brain to be angry. When you listen and spend two hours at night watching news broadcasts that are filled with exclamation points and incendiary commentary, castigating the people who don't think like them as something evil or bad, and you feed on that all the time. You are rewiring your brain and blinding yourself to seeing any nuance or balance. That's what's happened in America. That's what social media has been invaded and has done in America. And as believers, it is better not to have a social media account than to have something that's feeding your rage and hostility and anger. Because the only one that can handle anger is God. Truly, the only one that can wield it properly is God, and we can deal with it with the Holy Spirit's help, but we have to have great caution. If you read everything the Bible says to, uh, to his people about anger, the vast majority of it is a warning. Not to be condemned when we feel anger, but we have to be very careful what we do, and now the science tells us why. Turn to somebody and say, watch, 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 watch your angry words. 
In verse 31, he said this, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. The word clamor is krage in the Greek. You know what it means? Loud shouting. When husband and wife are just shouting at each other, it's not good. No one's listening. And it might end up in some kind of crazy makeup situation. But that's not how God wants you to express your intimacy. Now listen, how many of us in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our families, we see people, uh, you know, walking down the streets in our shop, they're just yelling at each other. People are yelling. They're in their faces all the time. I want you to know know something, believers. We're not supposed to be yelling at each other. When you're yelling and shouting and you're, listen, it's, the Bible says, let loud crying and loud shouting be put away from you. So that's just, that's just how we are. Listen, it doesn't matter if that's how your history is or your culture is or your community is. You're now in a new community. You're a new believer. And we're not supposed to, listen, I'm not saying you can't speak words that are truthful when you're feeling anger. What I'm saying is you've got to be very careful that you don't let that anger and that rage fill your mouth and you start shouting. I know you didn't come to hear this today, but you came to hear this today because the Holy Spirit wants to help some of you. One of the reasons that you're having challenges in your marriage, in your family, in your finances is because you've got to start putting, you're creating an environment where brains don't work, where love doesn't work, where peace can't work, where people can't think properly. Do you know you can discipline and you can express anger in a calm spirit? You don't have to scream. And I'm not speaking as someone that hasn't crossed the line many times. Oh, listen, my wife and I, we've had some wonderful opportunities to practice these verses. (laughs) And there are times that we have done it, and there's times that we have not done it. And I can just tell you right now, we've got so much more resolved by learning to communicate when we're feeling angry in a way that is not loud and shouting and deleterious and mocking and with cussing. I'm gonna tell you right now, the last word in this verse is put filthy language out of your mouth. I'm just gonna say it right now, the only F word you should be saying. Yeah, is forgive you. F you, forgive you. You get in my face, you yell at me, F you. I forgive you. Let's redeem that. Mm, Forgive you. And I got to stop talking. Has this been helpful today? Praise the Lord. Let's all stand up. Father, help us. Help us. Help us. Lord, we don't want to live in condemnation, but we've all, we all get angry, Lord. And we all feel anger. But Father, your word says that we're not to let that anger, that rage, that bitterness come out of our mouth. Lord, help us to learn to process it in a healthy way. To release it in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would, as you begin to purify our speech, as we learn to sit, not stuff, but release to you these feelings. Lord, help us to balance our brains, our bodies, our minds, and our hearts so that we can load our mouth with faith and vision and hope and peace. And Father, I pray for every person in this place that He's going to go home with an angry person that maybe wasn't in this place. I pray that you'd give them a place of peace in Jesus, that they'd teach them, Father, they don't have to return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Teach them to speak blessing. Teach us, Lord, to put a muzzle on our mouth 
and to speak words that build and bless. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You know, it's always the case after service that if you'd like to give your life to Jesus or you'd like to know more, you need prayer. Maybe some of the things we said are challenging and you have a situation. We have a wonderful team of people that are anointed to pray with you and minister to you every service. Just come to the front, come up here and we'll pray with you, talk with you. We have the next room and if you want to have a conversation more about what's happening in your life spiritually, we've got folks in the next room that are there to just listen and talk and and pray with you. We're here to help you. Amen? But God is building something in our lives in church because he wants us to be ready to take ground for him. Are you ready? Praise the Lord. May the Lord help us. May he bless us, keep us, make his face to shine upon us, be gracious to us, and give us peace as we seek and serve him. And may something great happen in your lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week. Hey, church family, thank you so much for joining us today. For this and other messages, you can head on over to our YouTube channel. You can just search AbundantLife.Church and you can watch all our messages on demand. Or you can watch it on our free church app. All you need to do is go to your device's app store and search Abundant Life Syracuse to do so. And if God has impacted your life through this ministry and you want to partner with us to reach others all throughout the world and in our community, you can do so by giving at alcclife.org slash give or you can give on our free church app. Again, we are so blessed that you decided to join us today. We hope that you enjoyed the service.